Hello class and welcome back. Okay, so we're back to video lectures. I know we had a lot of reading and other material, but it was really important to form that foundation and understanding of general technical documents and usability testing and web design, right? It's going to be really important when you're working throughout this unit. Now, what we're going to do is essentially we're going to take all of that material and knowledge and we're going to ground it in more concrete context, right? As we're going to just brush over these concepts and discuss how we can take that information and transform it into a evaluation or proposal, a memo, and a lab report, or technical writing, right? Because after all, this is still a technical writing course. Just turns out that usability testing is one really important and really, really essential in terms of today's professional world. A lot of industries are asking for user uh, researchers, user writer, UX writers, um, things like that. But it's also just, it lends itself really well to writing evaluations and proposals, right? Um, because when it comes to usability testing, you often work with clients. So it gives you a really good way to practice writing these particular technical documents to clients. Okay? Uh, so that's what we're going to focus on. I apologize if I sound a bit stuffy. I'm getting over a little bit of a bug, so just bear with me there. Okay? So let's get started. So I have a question for y'all. The question is, have you ever been frustrated by a website? Chances are you have, right? And the reason for that can vary. Um, you might have ran into cluttered menus. Things might have been impossible to complete. One of my favorite examples is a friend of mine who wanted to cancel a subscription, but just couldn't find a way to do so. Now, we might say that that's part of the design, right? They purposefully made it that way so that my friend would be forced to stay a member. But even if that is the design, we know that that's bad design because from a UX standpoint, a user researcher standpoint, we understand that when we frustrate the user, we lose their trust and we lose the chance for them to be our client, customer in the future. And right? we don't want that to happen. So what I want you guys to do is find an example of a bad website. Now a good way to think of a website you've had to use in the past year to accomplish something that just gave you a little bit of frustration now, this could be a college website, such an academic advising website, a restaurant website, anything at all, right? Uh, I just want you to think about the flaws that caused your frustration, and then write a few notes in your prep materials about those flaws that will help you throughout the unit. In fact, they'll be really helpful for when you conduct your usability test, right? Now, this is something you're going to have to do in this unit. Uh, what is a usability test? Well, as we know from Steve Krug's Rocket Surgery Made Easy, it's just a test where you watch people try to use what you're creating, designing, or building, or something that you've already created, designed, or built. Right? Generally, we have them voice their thoughts out loud so we can know what they're thinking and feeling as they use that particular product, service, or website. Right? Now, a usability test has two intentions. One, right, making it easy, making our product uh, design or service easier for people to use, or gathering information that proves that it is already easy to use, right? Think of it as like a quality check. Now for this assignment, of course, like we mentioned, you will find a poorly designed website, and you're going to create and conduct a usability test to get feedback on how successfully or poorly that site is designed for its intended users and purposes. Remember that video of Steve Krug actually conducting a usability test? we're going to follow the exact same format, do it the exact same way, right? So give that another look if you want a refresher. Now, of course, you're going to run a usability test with one user, and you're going to create a lab report proposing suggestions for improvement. Now, before you get to that lab report, there's two other documents that are generally written. Important thing to recognize here is that technical writing, professional writing, generally occurs in stages, right? So a lab report is generally the final stage. The two stages that come before that are going to be the website redesign evaluation or proposal and the usability protocol memo. Let's talk about the redesign evaluation proposal briefly. When I talk about a redesign evaluation, you're essentially going to evaluate a website and why it needs a redesign or why it might need a redesign, right? That doesn't mean you go and badmouth the site. That's not good because your client is going to be the owner of that website. What we do is we look for particular flaws. So say we could say, hey, your menu function is a bit confusing. Um, it might cause users a couple of issues. Look at this competitive site right, that has a much more well-organized menu. 
That means users are going to be able to find whatever it is that they need to accomplish easier, so they're going to return to that site simply because the user experience is better. Based off of this information, I propose right, a usability test that examines your website, tests for those flaws to understand what users are thinking, and then use, we can use that information for informed improvements. Right? So I evaluated the site, I proposed a usability test, right? and all of that together is meant to convince our client that a usability test conducted by us is a smart choice because it will draw more users to their site or improve the user experience for their uh, users. Makes sense, right? That's all there is to it. Now, once we would get approval for that, we would create the protocol memo. That is essentially the script, the scenarios, uh, the calendar, uh, the waivers that we would use during our test. Right? We take all that information and put it into a memo and we give it to our client just to show them, hey, this is what we're going to do on the day of the test. That way, our clients will say, okay, so now I'm up to date. I know what's going to happen. All right, proceed. After we conduct your usability test, that's where the lab report comes in. You gather all of your data and your information, and you put it into a report. Right? That's all there is to it. You can see it has a very logical structure, right? And all it's, a lot of times people don't understand that technical writing or professional writing in a variety of fields continues to work in stages. Um, but that's just how it works, and it's really important to be able to write in various stages. Now, you're going to be turning all of these documents in together, and that's just because we're limited on time, right? Since this is a school semester, right? We only have half the year to cover a lot of various concepts. Um, but it's just important to remember that... It's important to remember where these particular documents would show up in the stage of writing, right? Start with the redesign evaluation proposal, memo, then lab report. Okay, enough on that. Let's take a deeper dive into rocket surgery made easy. They bring up one important point, right? Watching users makes you a better designer. The question is why? Well, the answer is quite easy, actually. Uh, essentially, it's because it allows you to gather some qualitative data, right? Some easy qualitative data. Now, we, I know we can't prove something from qualitative data. But we can suggest improvements, that is, we can make informed suggestions. The qualitative data that we're gathering are essentially our users' thoughts, right, and their feelings and their opinions when they actually use our product or service. So when they use it, we can say, hmm, what are you thinking now? Or why are you using it that particular way? And they'll tell us. We can take that information, give it to the designers and say, hey, these are what your users are thinking when they use this, the current design. This is what they get frustrated with. A lot of them seem to get frustrated with that. We should probably fix it, right? It's still useful. Um, and the reason we need that, though, is because usability testing is easy, but it's often overlooked because designers think that they are their users. That is, they think that if the designer engineer understands it, well, then obviously the user will understand it, right? Wrong. We know that's wrong. We know that from the last unit, too. Usually when user error comes into play, is not the user's fault. It's actually the designers because they weren't paying attention to their users' needs or how their users will actually use or engage with their product or service. So that's why watching users makes us a better designer, right? Because it helps us pay attention to the people who are actually using our designs. Now, usability testing can be done on any design that has a user. It's a very useful tool for designers, engineers, and scientists who create things. In fact, you'd be surprised about how many things that you can conduct a usability test on. I've conducted usability tests on anything from websites to toothbrushes uh, and got paid for it, right? That's amazing. So, number one, if you have the ability to conduct usability tests, set up your own business, um, you'd be surprised about how many people actually make money that way. Number two, it'll prepare you for a understanding users, whether you're a designer, engineer, scientist, anything like that. Okay, now let's bring it all back to what we're doing, right? Now that we have that core understanding of our user and how the general understanding of what it is that you're doing. This assignment was generally done with people in groups, but this time you're going to be on your own, right? And that's just because you're online students. 
don't worry, I'm always happy to help out. So remember, feel free to request assistance. You're going to be writing for a client, testing one website and two pages in that site, right? And one of those two pages is going to be the home page, right? So you just have to find one more. Now, writing for a client is really important. That means the person that you are addressing through your documents is not going to be me. It's not going to be fellow students. It's going to be the owner of the website, right? Or the company that owns the website. That's who you are writing to. So remember that, right? You're going to test one participant. Um, it generally takes about 45 minutes, so make sure you block off some time. You're going to design a scripted Think Aloud protocol, including a home page tour and several common scenarios for participants to go through, right? The script is essentially what you're going to be saying during the test. Think aloud protocol means you're going to have to encourage your user to think out loud as voice their thoughts. And scenarios, those are just common tasks, right? So here's a quick, quick example. Say that we're testing a movie theater website. You can say, you are planning to go to the movies with friends on Saturday. Um, you, you want to go for a matinee showing. You want to go in the afternoon because you all have plans in the evening. Find me a ticket for one of the more popular movies um, that air, that shows around 1 o'clock p.m. That's the scenario, right? That's all there is to it. You essentially give your user a scenario that somebody would likely have to complete. Right? You have them complete it and see if they can complete it. This next part isn't mandatory. It usually is, but since you are our online students, I'm not going to make it mandatory. I do recommend it though that you record the screen with some kind of screen capture software and the usability test room with a small video camera or your cell phone. It just gives you a recording of the test happening so you always have access to that data in case you want to grab any useful quotes. But it's also usually a deliverable when it comes to user research. You give it to your clients so that they can see it for themselves, right? They can read your report and say, hmm, did they really say this? turn on the video and they can say yes okay so the user is actually frustrated with our design something like that that's all there is to it right? now when it comes to writing the proposal right you're going to be writing the proposal evaluating that website your memo is going to involve the script and think aloud protocol and then your lab report is going to take all of that data and put it into report form okay all right now let's shift gears and talk about web design we're going to Simplify and think about a few things that you can look for as you start um, your usability reports. When it comes to website design, it all boils down to one golden rule that is don't make me think. Web design should be obvious and self explanatory. Don't create frustration and confusion. Let a user accomplish tasks as easily as possible. Right? They shouldn't be thinking so much when they enter a web page. Here we can see examples of someone who's thinking too much, right? Or a website that causes someone to think too much. If you have a user running into these thoughts during your test, chances are that the website is not well designed, right? And needs a redesign. That's why you're conducting the test. Let's look at an example. This is the Manchester United webpage. For those of you who don't know who Manchester United is, they're a very famous soccer team, right? My question to you is, does this website make you think too much? Some of you may have said yes, some of you may have said no. Um, I'm on the side of yes, right? Now the website isn't completely terrible, but it is a bit more complicated than it needs to be. We have a really, really long localized menu. We have a lot of links here. There doesn't seem to be uniformity because there's a giant gap here, likely room for an ad, right? Uh, we have a menu up here, but the hierarchy of this menu does not follow the hierarchy of the menu here. Shop is first here, but shop, I have to look all the way down here for this little image of a shopping cart. More importantly, let's think of a scenario. I want to buy tickets for uh, a season. Where can I do so? Well, generally, I'd probably click on shop first, right? But you see down here in their localized menu, they also have season tickets. What I would have my user do is I would essentially ask them to buy the tickets and see if they could do so through the shop. Right, And if they can't do it through the shop and they overlook the season tickets link here, I could say your menus are too complicated. Right? If somebody were trying to buy season tickets, it needs to be easier than that. 
Other flaws that we could point out are the banner isn't clickable, right? It suggests to me that it might be clickable, um, things like that. At least our logo is clickable, though. Okay, we're spending a lot of time here. Let's get back to the, the lecture. So that's essentially it, right? Don't make me think too much. Uh, it generally does, you can generally make a conclusion on whether a website is making you think too much by spending about 10 seconds on the web page, right? Um, so keep that in mind. When you are conducting your usability test, if you see your user thinking, right, when they reach the home page, chances are they're not going to be voicing their thoughts because that's not something we normally do. So encourage them to voice their thoughts at that point. If you can get them to say things like this, right, when you know they're thinking too much, it'll help you as you write your reports. All right, now let's look at pages a bit more specifically. A home page. What should a successful home page do? Right? Well, there are a couple of goals. Um, these are common questions that a user should be able to find an answer to immediately. What is this website? What's the company? How can I get from here to the place I need to be, or the right page? The home page should spell out the big picture of the site immediately. Right? That's what we want from a home page. If you choose a website and the home page doesn't do that, that's something you would want to bring up in a proposal in your evaluation, right? And that's something that you'd want to test during your usability test, okay? And that's something that you'd want to build scenarios around in your memo. These are things to think about as you're looking through your websites. When it comes to a homepage, though, we can boil it down to a couple of core things. A homepage should have clear navigation, right? It should be easy to navigate to the page they want. Clear imagery and logo a search bar, it should avoid needless words, and it should resonate with the target audience, right? That's it, that's all there is to it. From the home page, they should immediately know how they could go about completing their task, right? That's what we want from the home page, that's what a successful home page does. We're not gonna evaluate any examples, we're just going to evaluate a website at the end of the lecture, so whenever you see this, just ignore it, it was a last minute change, okay? All right, now that we know what makes a good home page, let's talk about site structure, right? There generally should only have to be three levels of a site structure, home page, level one, level two, and level three. Now, the only time this rule is broken is if a website is really, really complex, right? But since you're working with small scale websites, it shouldn't break this rule. The reason for that is simple. The deeper people have to go to reach the site, the page that they need, the more frustrating this website is to use, um, and the bigger the chance of your user getting lost along the way. Now, when it comes to getting to these lower level pages, it could be a product page or anything like that, it should be easy and obvious, right? They should be able to get to it easily and quickly, and they should know exactly how to get to it and exactly where they are once they get to it. What that essentially means is simple, right? When they get to level one, the content that shows up on that page should belong on that page. That is, it should make sense as to why it's there, right? And getting a user to that content should be easy. Now that said, understanding what content belongs in what section and how to get a user to that content is one of the most difficult parts of web design. So a really good way to see whether or not a website is successful is to look at its site structure, right? Say you want to buy a product. How many pages did you have to go through? Was it easy? Is useful content on that page? Is the appropriate content on that page? Right? An example of a flaw is this. Say we're back at that movie website, right? If I wanted to buy tickets and I went to the shop page or the product page and instead I got a bunch of uh, information about concessions, that content does not belong in that section, right? There we have a flaw. Okay. Essentially, it all boils down to this. I should know how to use the site and be able to learn more complex functions quickly while completing tasks, and tasks should be easy to complete. Right? And I should be able to get to various levels of the site quickly. Here's an example for you to test out, right? Whether or not a site has a good home page and has good site structure. Go find the graduation checklist from the OU College of Engineering website. 
So a fun little uh, exercise, and you can come back and see whether or not, and make a decision for yourself of whether or not the site structure is good and whether the home page is useful. I'll give you a hint, it could definitely be better. Okay, now let's talk about the page structure itself. So we've gone over the home page, what it should do, the site structure. Now let's get a little bit more detail on the what various pages should look like. Right? It generally just follows your scannability rules. There should be a clear visual hierarchy. The size, spacing, and font should be consistent, right? And shouldn't be uh, too crazy. Nesting, that means important information should be contained together, right? We don't want to have uh, information that belongs to each other scattered all across the page. We want to chunk our pages into clear sections, right? So if you have multiple product pages, they should be chunked under um, a general product page, right? There should be a product link on your menu, and then all your various product pages should be chunked together underneath that. You want to avoid having too much on any page. There is such a thing as information overload, right? Information overload makes your users think too much. Be aware of content below the fold. That is when we have content um, that needs to be scrolled to, we don't want to. We want to demonstrate to our users that they need to scroll to it, right? Oftentimes, you'll run into a website that looks like it's just one page. When you start scrolling, or one very short page, when you start scrolling, you see a lot more information, but there was no indication that you should have started scrolling. Right? That's an issue. These are just some things to think about, right? You can go on Google and look at other examples of web design failures. People have been researching this for a very long time, right? It's up to you to choose the flaws that you want to talk about for your particular reports. Here's a general, uh, pretty detailed wireframe of a page structure or a model of a page structure. You can see that they've got local navigation, uh, tab navigation, navigation links, things like that. It's generally going to be some kind of variation of this, right? If you look at the Manchester United page, you can see that it does follow this structure a bit. So you can see that the page isn't terrible. But then again, right, we could have definitely made some improvements. You can see here the local navigation is short. Um, the navigation links up there. And they have contact us at the end. Only three options that would likely be home, some kind of product page, or something like that, right? Simple. Simplified websites are often better. Okay, now that we know page structure, home page structure, and site structure, right? Let's talk about one of the aspects of web design where a lot of flaws start to show up, and that's navigation. And there's generally one goal to navigation, or one golden rule. It should let me get to where I want to go, and I should know where I am at all times, right? That is it. If a website breaks any breaks that rule in any way, that's a flaw, and that's something you could talk about. So how do we make sure that navigation is good? Well, number one, you make the navigation terms obvious. You give a search bar. Navigation should stay the same across all pages. Your navigation terms shouldn't just suddenly change. Navigation should tell us where we are. Right? One of the best ways that websites can quickly improve is simply by renaming navigation terms. Right? You'd be surprised at how many people use poor navigation terms. Oftentimes they're trying to be cute or clever, but trying to be cute or clever should not be your first choice. The first choice should be making something usable. Okay? Okay. Uh, now when it comes to navigation, you essentially want some kind of signposting that, right? Once I'm on a page, I should be able to see the title of this specific page, have a visual marker of the page I'm on, maybe a button is lit up on the navigation tab, and know the path I took to get to that page. Some kind of breadcrumb trail, right? You often see it in really small text somewhere on the page where it says home page, has a little carrot or an arrow pointing right, it says product page, another arrow pointing right, will say something like lug nuts. Right? Shows you how you got to where you are. As long as it has some kind of visual marker, some kind of signposting, that's a good way to show users where they are. If a website lacks signposting, it's a good way to confuse users and a good way to get users to misunderstand where they are right? or forget where they are. Now, like we said on the previous page, uniformity is really important when it comes to signposting or any type of navigation. 
when I click something, the title of the button should match the title of the page I'm set to. Right? So for example, if I was to click on something that said, said lug nuts, I would want to show up on a page that says lug nuts, right? I don't want to show up on a page that says nuts. I don't want to end up on a page that says spare parts. Even if lug nuts are on these two pages, right? Always match it. You should always help the user understand exactly where they are at all times. The worst of the worst is the page not found, right? Now, that's generally sometimes unavoidable because something will break on the website, but um, that's a really easy flaw to point out, right? In terms of a usability test or in terms of your lab report. Attention client, your page is broken, right? Okay. This all boils down to the trunk test, right? This is something that is uh, something we've talked about before, and you're seeing it in practice and usability testing. Remember, the trunk test is imagine that you've been blindfolded and locked in the trunk of a car and then driven around for a while, and then dumped on a page somewhere deep in the bowels of a website. If the page is well designed, when your vision clears, you should be able to answer these couple of questions without hesitation. What site is this? What page am I on? What are the major sections of this site? What are my options at this level? Where am I in the scheme of things? How can I search? These questions, if you can have the answers to them quickly, that's great usability, right? That's a well-designed website. If you struggle to answer these questions, that particular page needs quite a bit of work. Okay, so let's sum it all up. Uh, when it comes to your home page, right, it should be tell them what the site is, what the general goal of the site is, right? And it should give them some easy navigation and some scannable imagery and links. When it comes to site structure, it shouldn't go deeper than three levels, right? Because once we go deeper than three levels, that's when we run into issues, uh, specifically navigation issues. And when it comes to navigation, we want to be people to be able to navigate our site easily, but also know where they are at all times. And the best way to do that is to make sure that our links are uniform, right? And that they have signposts to tell users where they are. That's all it is, all summed up and put together, right? Now, whenever you see a flaw in each of those areas, that's something that you could bring up in your proposal. Um, that's something that you could test in your usability test, right? So whenever you're working through these sites, think about how you can take this information and translate it into your documents, okay? So take notes as you're looking through these websites. The last thing that you can always suggest in terms of usability is beautification. I'd rather you focus on functions because that's more important, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you do run into a website that's just, if we're going to be honest, ugly, right? These are some things that you could suggest. Uniformity, using the same navigation hierarchy, same tiles across the entire site. White space, give your information and images some breathing room. Clutter is terrible, right? It's just awful. Color scheme, repeated meaningful colors. Goal is the three color, 60, 30, 10 rule. You can see an example of it here. If I was to ask anyone what the primary colors are for this particular uh, image, it'd be easy, they could easily say white, blue, orange, right? Right off the bat. Visual hierarchy is consistent, it's image driven. Images should generally be clickable, right? People love clicking on images. Uh, and of course, just keep things as scannable as possible. Okay. Now, based off of everything that we've learned so far, we're going to take a look at one more example. Uh, well, actually, two more examples. Let's talk about Harry's, right? Now, I posted this earlier, so you guys have already explained it or explored it. This is a really good example of a usable website, right? It's simple. It's to the point. It's well-designed. We were talking about beautification just now, right? You can see that there's a lot of white space. Uh, they focus on three general primary colors. Um, everything is consistent. It's completely image-driven, right? And call to actions are easy. You can see the carrots tell you there's going to be a drop-down menu. They have shave plans, Harry's for the uh, home page. You can start a trial. There's a cart, sign in, help. If you scroll down, right, below the full content, they suggest to you because this is clipped off that you can scroll on the website, right? And they give you a bunch of clear information. Now I'll have another video that kind of picks this particular website apart um, in more detail uh, if you want to give it a look. But essentially what we see here is a very usable website, right? It's, it functions well, 
I know exactly what the purpose of the site is when I'm on the home page. Home page goal of a site has to do with shaving, right? You can start a trial. There's shave plans. Things I can do on the site. I can buy products. Probably some of these shaving products, right? Um, goal of the site to try out the product. Start trial. They tell me how the trial works. They tell me more about it, and they tell me about the various products they have. Home page is great. When we go to the actual site or different pages, right? We go down one level. We're on the product page. Right? It's good. We can go to the about page. You'll see the factory. Right? But what we can see is that I never have to go through multiple levels. They keep me at most, I probably just have to go through one, one level, right? So I can immediately come back to Harry's, the home page. I can go down one more level to social, right? But all my navigation will help me get back to exactly where I am. Site structure is good. Now we saw the navigation, we just kind of talked about that with site structure. It's good, I can get, I know exactly where I am, I know how to get there quickly. Um, it's a successful site, right? My question to you would be this, if you were going to improve something on this site, what would it be? Okay, all right, now let's talk about beautification. Some of you may already be familiar with the site, the site is Reddit. Uh, now Reddit is not, the most beautiful site in the world. However, it's very usable. People might actually think it's not usable, but it's actually a very good example of usability. It sacrifices good looks for pure function, right? And the same thing goes for Craigslist. A lot of people think Craigslist is very ugly, but it functions really well, right? It's easy to complete tasks. It may even seem cluttered, right? And arguably it is quite a bit, but you'll be able to find whatever it is that you need to accomplish. So one warning I will give you is just because a site is ugly does not necessarily mean that it is bad in terms of usability. Keep that in mind, right? I will say though that Harry's is both beautiful and usable, so that website gets two thumbs up from me. Okay, that's all there is for this particular video. I uh, Keep plugging away on your work, and we're going to be devoting a lot of time to work. Um, really diving in. And of course, ask me any questions if you have any.